why you might want to use it and what it is. And um, we will also hear from, though, um, a state that's actually used the toolkit and is in the process of, of documenting some of their data processes. So, and finally, we'll talk about how we're going to get our little hands on this toolkit. In the background, we have Carol Lee um, Esslinger, who is helping us kind of make sure we're staying on time and on target because some of us, I'm not going to name names, kind of like to, to ramble on. Um, I wouldn't know anything about that personally. Um, so, who is on the call today? We have a poll. We'll start out with that and kind of find out who's on besides those of us with IDC and Oklahoma folks. So it looks like um, we have quite a few others or no, um, no answers, but the most of the folks that are on here are the IDEA data managers. So hopefully we'll, we will be speaking some of your language um, as we move forward throughout this, this webinar. So I want to reiterate and, and talk about a couple of things really quickly. Um, we're, I mentioned this before, but we are going to cover what the toolkit is, what the components are, why it's important to document your data processes. And I'm going to say a little bit about that. Um, we'll go into it more, but I wish that I had, I, some of you may know that I was, last year at this time, I was the Part C coordinator for the state of Kansas. I wish we had had more documented, and I'm going to guess that the person who took my place wishes that we had had more documented. Um, so that's, we're going to really talk about that and some other um, reasons why you might want to have it be important, why it's important that you document your data processes. As I mentioned, you'll hear from one state who's used this tool um, and benefited from it. Hopefully, we did not pay them to say that, that they benefited from it, but um, I believe that they have. And then we want to talk about, finally, how you can get your hot little hands on this tool and what are the next steps in doing that. Um, I will say that this is more than your average toolkit, so we will talk about a little bit about um, what you get along with the toolkit. It's not just a bunch of paper. So that's the exciting part about it as well. So things to ponder. I, when I see this little um, picture on here, I always think of, um, that song from the early 90s, things that make you go, hmm. And so some things to ponder. We have another poll coming up. And so what do you, do most of you feel like you understand the roles of your colleagues in your department and how they intersect with your own, regardless of what your um, role is on the call? So let's talk a little bit about that. Um, and... If there's anybody who has anything, so do you feel like you understand those roles, yes or no? Go ahead and answer the poll. Or do you kind of live in your own little cubicle doing your thing? And if you can't answer clearly yes or no, you can chat that or chat that, type that into the chat box as well. Because I don't know, some of us have a hard time answering yes, no, straight up. Some of us like a yeah, but or yes and. <laughs> okay, and let's look at the results of that of the poll and see what you all. So most of you feel like you do have a pretty good understanding of um, your role, the roles of your colleagues in your department and how they intersect with your own. So that's actually great news. Um, but then some of you probably were the no answer that yes and no, sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. Um, so another thing to think about, um, administrators, do you, actually let's chat about that a little bit in terms of how you feel that your um, role is understood. Does anybody have any, you know, initial thoughts about that? Feel free to raise your hand and um, 
Rick can let us know if somebody has raised their hand and or type in the chat box. I'm I'm gonna open the chat a little bit so I can see. There we go. Okay, so let's move on to the next poll. So the next poll we're going to ask if you understand your own role at times, some of you may be brand new. There were times where um, I know when I first came into, well, any time you first come into any job, you're still trying to feel things out. Do we have anybody out there right now that's kind of in that situation where you feel like your own role is still yet to be defined? And it's okay if you don't want to, you know, out yourself. I understand. <laughs> There's, this is a no judgment zone. Anybody have any thoughts about understanding their own role? What we're trying to do here is kind of set that stage that within every, I think, agency and working within a state agency, um, there's always a time where you kind of feel like, okay, where, what do I need to be doing next at times? So I'm going to move on to um, administrators. Do you feel comfortable signing off on your data this year? Or did you? And some other things to think about. Um, did you have documentation available to you when you started your job? I know when I first stepped into the role at um, a state agency, everybody's always so busy doing the work and doing the work and doing the work that it's hard and you don't always know for the next person coming in what that job entails because they don't have time to stop, breathe, and document what they've been doing. Another question to think about is does your state have documentation have a documentation process for your 618 data, which is your annual reports, and what do those include? And then lastly, before I move on, I'm going to ask you, I'm asking you how prepared is your program for when a key staff member chooses to retire or change positions? And I think it's ironic that I'm sitting here talking about this because I know I um, personally put our state through that last year. and. Um, that's a tough place to be, so hopefully we won't claim that this um, toolkit will solve every problem in the world, but it will go a long way in helping for you to know what's going on. So I'm going to kind of move along. I'm looking at the clock, and I want to get it into the meat of things. What is this toolkit for anyway? It's for documenting the 618 data processes and creating a culture of high quality data, establishing a consistent, consistent practices for valid and reliable data, and building capacity for, of state staff. We always used to say, and I always used to say, I, I changed it over the years from what happens if I get hit by a bus? What happens if I win the lottery? What happens if the whole staff wins, wins the lottery? What happens if the the agency um, secretary comes and says, I want to know how you do this. Um, how do you explain that to them? So I think that some, this toolkit is to help with some of that. We want to specify that these collections contain um, information about how you go about finding the data and those kinds of things. So um, protocols are also under development for the 616 SPPAPR data indicators as well. So hopefully in the next um, while you will be seeing some more information about that as well. I am now going to pass the baton on to Lindsay, Lindsay Wise and she's going to talk a little bit more about the components of the toolkit. And now this is where I have to smooth the ball. Lindsay. There you go, Lindsay. Did I get you? I did. Take it away, Lindsay. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now, Sarah? Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you for that introduction. So I'm Lindsay Wise, and I um, was actually on the part a part of the team that created these um, data processes protocols and the calendar. Um, and so we're just going to take the next few minutes to chat a bit about what's actually in the toolkit, and then after that we'll talk about what the process looks like. Um, it's sometimes it's a little bit hard to separate out the protocols and the nuts and bolts of the actual toolkit from the TA services that we provide along with it. Um, it's a really um, fairly unique process um, and system or something. I guess. So it is, though, really important to understand what the components of the toolkit are so that you have a clue what you're getting into. We have an overview, which is useful if you're thinking about the toolkit and you want to get to know a little bit more about it or to share it with people around your department. Uh, the overview has a really nice write-up and uh, details some of what you're hearing today. Um, the heart of the toolkit, or actually the main body of the toolkit, are the um, data process protocols. They are where you would be documenting all of the work and all of the tasks and um, procedures and processes that go into collecting and submitting your 618 data. We also have a calendar, which you can either fill out at the same time as you're doing those protocols. Um, or separately, it depends on how you want to structure that work. And then we have additional resources, some of which might be familiar to you if you've looked at the new data manager toolkit. Um, the additional resources are um, just have some useful stuff in them, and I will talk about them a little bit later. So the data collection protocols, this is an important part, are in Word. Um, because what we want this toolkit to be is completely tailored to the state needs so that um, when you're doing this work or even after IDC has left and you're, you have your processes, you can make them whatever you want them to be, whatever suits the structure of your state. Um, let's see. So as I said, the protocols are really the main section of the toolkit, and there's one protocol for each data collection. There's one for child count and settings, one for exiting, and one for dispute resolution. And basically what they are is, at its heart, a blank table that contain headings where um, IDC will uh, come to your state and talk through all of those processes and help you to think through step by step what needs to be documented and exactly how things are done. Um, they just provide the structure for documenting those processes and how exactly you do the work. And as Sarah said, we're uh, in the middle of creating the 616 protocols, or the ones for each SPP APR indicator. So in a few months, I'd say you can look for those to come out um, where you can document not only your um, data that is submitted to EdFax via eMaps, you can also be starting to document your um, APR indicators. So I wanted to show you what the um, protocols look like. This is the child count and settings protocol. And it's a little bit small here, but you can see in the green bars with the white text, we have what I refer to as headings. And then each of the white sections is where the state information goes. And so in this screenshot, um, everything's pretty tight together and, and packed together, but what happens is as you fill these out and as you enter all of the important information from your state, they get really long so that um, depending on the data collection and the level of detail, they can get sort of up to maybe 10 pages or so of information about exactly how things go in your state. Um, and again, it's all in words, so if some of the headings don't make sense to you or you want to add a heading, which is pretty common, if there's some aspect of your work or you want to talk more about your data systems, we can just pop in another bar and you can document that and so that it really works for you. A little bit more about the protocols. Um, this is 
a little bit of a long list. Um, it shows each of the headings. So the essential elements here on the left have um, more of what I consider the nuts and bolts, or it's the information about how you do your work. What do you really call your collection? Who are the people involved? What are the dates that you need to do things? And then the processes part uh, is the part where you detail out step by step how that uh, information, not, well, how the information comes from your data system, how you analyze it, process it, um, and submit it, and then any follow-up that needs to be done. Um, moving on to the data collection calendar, again, the calendar is in Word, and we've pre-filled it with reporting deadlines and other dates, and there's just one calendar so that you would be documenting your entire year's worth of um, data collection and reporting uh, in that one calendar, and um, eventually what you can also do if you go so far as to create all of the 616, or I always call them 616 protocols, but your SPPAPR uh, protocols, you could have a department-wide calendar, and this is just one version. Um, uh, our calendar is pretty basic, but um, we can work with you to make it whatever you want it to be, honestly. Um, and again, because it belongs to the state. And then what would happen is that you would post that calendar and post those protocols on your state shared drive so that everybody can access them and update them as needed. And then lastly, the additional resources contain an acronym list, um, which you may have seen before, and uh, a list of quick links, which are great if you are trying to remember where to find that document, where to log into EMAPS, how to get to Grad360. We have all of those links which you can also copy and paste into each protocol so that you don't have to move around. You can just have those links sprinkled everywhere that you need them. And then the due date list, which we at um, IDC will have to update that regularly. I think right now it goes up through 1617. Um, that is a bird's eye view of the toolkit and all of the uh, parts of it. And now what we're going to do is hear from Oklahoma who actually I had the pleasure of um, visiting them last year and uh, they piloted the Part C protocols for us and it was wonderful and so I'm hoping they're going to say a lot of very nice things about us in, uh, <laughs> in the next few minutes and I will let them introduce themselves. So take it away, Ginger and Eric. Oh, I'm passing the ball. Thank you, Lindsay. Can you uh, make us presenter, please? Yep, there you go. Uh, perfect. Thank you. Okay, um, good afternoon everyone. My name is Ginger Elliott Teague and with me is Eric Friend. We are the um, data managers for both Parts B and Part C. We may be unique in the country in having two data managers who both share those responsibilities. So it makes for um, a good working partnership between B and C that we're able to um, work with both data sets at the same time. But the um, Early Intervention Service Program in Oklahoma is called Sooner Start. It is jointly managed by the Department of Ed and the Department of Health. Except for contract providers, all staff are state employees. Mark Sharp is the state director in the Department of Ed, and he has a counterpart over in um, health. Service coordinators are education employees. Service providers are under the health umbrella. Um, the last person I want to um, sort of introduce as part of our team, she couldn't be here today, but Luann Mullins is also on the leadership team, and she oversees monitoring and compliance data or technical assistance for Sooner Start in the Department of Ed. And she's had many roles across Sooner Start over the years and really knows the program. For a time, she was also responsible for data management, so she really understands the data needs of the program too. And she's been invaluable for helping us define sort of the data um, sources and collection needs um, from a programmatic perspective. We began talking with IDC folks in March of last year about documenting the Part C data collections. Eric and I had been data managers for less than six months at that time. 
so we were very new and we stumbled through the APR submission in January and February. Neither of us came from districts or Sooner Start, so the federal reporting requirements were completely new to us and admittedly almost foreign. So without Luann's help, uh, we would have been completely lost. No documentation existed outside of a two-page um, set of Luann's notes. Um, and so when we started talking to IDC, we believed that Part C would really benefit from a thorough review and documentation of the data sources collection procedures, reporting processes, and so forth. So we were very glad to begin this. The, uh, once we thought about the need for the protocol, we, start, we started the process of documenting. Uh, we worked through April with IDC to plan an in-person work group for June. And we spent two days in person with them, talking through every detail of data sources, reporting processes, and so forth. Luann and Mark were present, along with our EdFacts coordinator, Don Williams. We had multiple people from IDC and other organizations um, there, too. The discussions were very valuable for us to help us understand the requirements, even the calculations, um, who would do what, and so forth. But one of the trickier parts of the discussion was that we were even then preparing to create an entirely new data collection system that would be implemented in December of last year. That did happen. And um, so when we were talking through our processes, it was a little bit difficult to talk about what had been happening versus what would be happening. And we're actually, next week, we're having a follow-up in-person meeting with IDC for two days again to uh, work through and document the new procedures. I would just add to that statement was when we were going through all the different um, processes and making sure that we were uh, uh, documenting every step along the way that um, it really helped us, this, this tool really helped us stay on track and stay on task and help us helped us to uh, really understand the process and not miss the, the points that w uh, could have easily been just glossed over um, because you know some people just know that stuff um, coming into this job we didn't we really didn't know any of it and so to walk through that process step by step and making sure that th and this tool helped us really look at every single piece and not just um, skip something because, well, you know, Luann's known that for years. Well, Luann's not doing this particular job anymore. So, um, and without Luann here, we would have just been out, you know, out the pasture, not really know, known what to do. So, um, we would have had to figure it out by the hard way, but really documented, this, this, this tool really helps you document every single piece of, um, the process so that you don't miss something. And if you are new, then um, you can really just go to this source and just look at it. And it's really kind of helped us think about what we're going to do on the Part B side even. So this has really been a growing experience for us uh, starting in the Part C area, which I think is a great thing. Because reporting happens essentially once a year, and because we're also responsible for Part B, as well as other reports like SIP and other things, um, the protocol is essential for us. Now, I can't say that we've used it a lot this year, partly because of our changing procedures and data sources and so forth, and um, it wasn't quite complete with our first go around, so we're looking forward to finishing that up um, next week and after that. But we want to have a quick, efficient, effective way to answer the question, how do we do that again? And the protocols, we believe, will help us ensure high data quality and consistency um, once they're fully documented and we're able to use them. Yeah. And I would, I would add to that, uh, the, one of the other reasons I don't think that we used it as much this particular year is because while we were developing this new Part C um, data, our data system to collect all our IFSP information, um, it was always in our face. So we were always, you know, we were always having to 
um, uh, go over that same structure over and over and over and over. So we kind of drilling it into our heads as, as well as just always knowing it. So we didn't really have to go over it uh, again and again and again. We have to go back to our documentation um, to figure it out because we, I mean, it was always there. It's always present. Um, I think that as time goes on, or if there is turnover, that we will need it will be invaluable to have that to, uh, that documentation to go back to and say, uh, how did we do that again? Um, I, you know, that was last year. We've had a billion things go on since last year, and I can't remember exactly what we did. Let me let me look it up. Let me make sure that that process we're doing the exact same way this year as we did last year, so we can just walk through it step by step, and we don't have, we're not going to miss any little little pieces. From um, an administrator perspective, we think that this is a phenomenal tool to give to new data managers who come in so that they don't experience sort of the cluelessness that we did when we came in. We had really no one to advise us on what to do and how to do it, just a set of deadlines <laughs> that uh, uh, we were expected to meet. So. Um, we'll be glad to answer more questions at the end of the presentation if you have any. Um, Eric, do you have anything? No. Okay. Um, we will now pass it over to Tony, who will take it from here. Great. Thank you, Ginger and Eric, for sharing your experience and working with IDC on the data protocols. Uh, we also truly appreciate uh, Mark's leadership and Luann's uh, great contributions as well to your team. And I, I know for me, I found our visit last year was very valuable and I, I learned a lot. Um, and I do want to take a step back and Ginger and Eric both acknowledged uh, these two points in that uh, the data protocols were developed to help with the turnover that states have in, in the data manager positions, uh, which do affect uh, issues with data quality. So what we have found is that the facilitated documentation, as we have heard from our friends in Oklahoma and others who have worked on this, has resulted in clarification of processes understanding of requirements, increased communication, uh, and it also helps to establish a common language across the state and local agencies. So when we say child count, we all know what we're talking about, uh, what the activities are and responsibilities are, as well as timelines. And this is all done in order to ultimately have improved data quality, uh, making sure that we have accurate, complete, reliable, and valid data for reporting and ultimately to use to help inform decision making. So the value of process documentation, uh, it does result in a process manual. It records institutional knowledge, so when somebody leaves, they're not taking that knowledge with them. It allows for gap analysis uh, for process improvement. So as you document your pr current process, and we do highly recommend that you go back before you start your next uh, data uh, cycle, your data collection cycle, to go back and look and see if there are areas where you would like to improve, and if so, document those. And check in with each other. Do it as a team. Take the team approach. Uh, this documents responsibilities and timelines, and, and, and it does facilitate a collaborative culture for high-quality data. So what does all of this have to do with data quality? A poorly managed reporting process can lead to poor data quality because there are no controls in place. Uh, People don't know what to do. People don't know who to go to. And then when there is a process, we find that many times it is not documented. So, for example, one year you may have a review process to ensure the accuracy of the data, and the next year you may not have it, or if you have that review process, it may not be as stringent because you don't have your timelines documented on this activity and people are running out of time to get the data reported. 
So, the, so this needs to be documented by listing the activity or your activities along with who is involved and when these activities will be done. There are dangers of poor quality data. If you have poor data quality and you want to make informed decisions, then where do you begin? What are your main priorities improving your programs or helping children make progress? So you can see that um, we do, that having high quality data is important for reporting, but it's also important for being able to use the data beyond the reporting. So if you cannot make informed decisions, uh, for example, in selecting improvement strategies or the right intervention for your children, uh, you, you will not be able to make those right decisions for selecting uh, strategies for your children and programs. And eventually, if the data quality is consistently poor, then data consumers, uh, that is your directors, parents, providers, legislators, program staff, and your ICCs will not use the data or continue to use anecdotal evidence to make decisions. And if this all sounds familiar, this is what the ESIP is doing. The ESIP is giving us an opportunity to use our data beyond the, uh, our other federal reporting requirements. It's, it's having us look at the data to inform our decisions. By having a documented process, it gives you the ability to replicate procedures that are performed infrequently. So I did mention earlier uh, the reasons for having the data process toolkit. And it's also to make sure that for folks who are there, that they have that documentation to repeat their steps from year to year to help ensure that accuracy of the data. High quality, we cannot stress this enough. High quality data is a team effort that requires communication and understanding. Working on documenting your process gives those involved an opportunity to speak, to contribute, and explain how things work. It also provides you an opportunity to understand what is meant when you say you're working on child count, for example and also provides an understanding of what your colleagues' roles and responsibilities are, what your roles and responsibilities are. And what we are seeing is that many times people are amazed at how much work and how many different hats uh, you are wearing or your colleagues are wearing. And the documented process helps reduce the learning curve for new staff. And uh, this enables new staff coming in to know not only to know what to do and who to contact. And many times it can be a challenge to find people who we need to talk to when we step into these new positions and roles. The role of the Part C coordinator is key for helping to document the process, which leads to the path of building a data culture, a culture that embraces not only the documentation of the data collection process, but embraces the high quality data to use for informed decision making. Part C coordinators can facilitate in the involvement of staff from other divisions, participate in the initial and ongoing meetings, allocate and protect time for early intervention staff to accomplish the work, uh, leverage the work to foster improved communications across the state. And this is key because when we talk about improving communications across the state, it may be people that work in our same office, but if we're in a state where people in our same office actually work in another town or city, then those opportunities to get together and talk about this work are uh, pretty infrequent if they do occur at all. And the 
Part C coordinator also should be spotlighting the work and recognizing the ex efforts of staff. And this is a definite morale booster. This is very difficult and time consuming work and uh, everybody should be applauded for a job well done. So to sum up, the benefits to the states are, a, are having a comprehensive documented process and schedules for all 618 IDEA data collection. It increases the knowledge and skills of new data managers and other staff, but it also increases knowledge and skills for those who have been around for a while. It helps to build that collaborative culture for a high quality data collection, verification, analysis, and submission. It helps to improve communication and relationships among data staff across the state. Increases the understanding of data manager responsibilities, challenges, and needs for support by the Part C coordinator and other key staff members. And to help with seamless succession planning, help alleviate the learning curve for new people coming in. And with that, I do thank you for your time and I will turn it over to Lindsay. Thanks, Tony. Um, let's see, actually, uh, Rick, can you bring up the poll about uh, the turnover in states? Yep. So um, this is a poll that is going to ask whether, I think it's have you, oh good, here it is. Um, have you had staff turnover in key positions in the last year? You'll see that on the right hand side of your screen. Actually on the Part C side, I have seen lots of turnover this year. I know there's been a lot of states uh, with new staff at various levels in different positions. Um, so we'll just give you guys a minute or so here to uh, fill that out. You know, and to think about while you're doing that and as we're waiting, thinking about the challenges that that new person in your department may be facing and um, the skills that they are needing to learn. What if, you know, if it's a person who's not a data manager, what are the things that they need to know to work effectively with the data manager or work effectively with the coordinator to understand what else is happening in that department? This type of documentation, if you come in and they can say, oh, wow, I see, these are the processes. Um, you know, sh once you've completed the toolkit, sharing the toolkit with those folks can be really beneficial. Rick, how are we doing here? I can cancel it whenever you want. Sure, let's see what we got. Give the poll 20 seconds to close. <laughs> It's like a toaster. <laughs> All right, how is there a countdown, Rick? What do we got now? I'm yeah, impatient. I am sharing the results now. All right, let's see. So we've had, it's pretty small. It looks like we've had, is that nine Part C coordinators here and 10 Part C data managers? Is that correct? Yep. Um, and then three new APR coordinators, eight program managers. Um, I think those are really significant numbers as we think about what's going on for all of our friends in these states. Um, that's a lot of new folks who have a lot of learning to do. Um, and as you think about that, what is the documentation that they came into in the state? Um, or if you are one of those new people, how have you learned, how have you gotten up to speed? Um, so basically what we're saying is we're hoping that this toolkit, either if it was completed beforehand, you would have something to fall back on, but also the process of 
completing the toolkit and, um, and, and going through that process of all of those discussions can really help with people's learning curves, as it did for Eric and Ginger. It gave them that time to sit with Luann and Mark, um, and it gave that team those hours to come together and gain that understanding and get, you know, even get to know each other better, find out ways where they can support each other so that Eric and Ginger understand Luann's needs. Mark understands all of the things that are happening uh, with his team. Um, so that if you're a new Part C coordinator and you want to see what's going on in this department and uh, start to lay that out, lay that foundation, um, it's a good thing. So what can you expect from IDC? Um, we have a group of wonderful t TA providers who are always fun to work with. I like working with everybody, um, who are here to facilitate the process. So we will um, help to organize those in-person meetings, send a team out to your state. Um, and then when we're doing this process with you, asking those directed questions. Um, I am not tooting my own horn at all here, but people have said to me, you ask such good questions. And really, the only question I feel like I ever ask in these sessions when I'm working with a state is, why or how? So I just say, why do you do it that way? And then we talk about the answer, and then we write it down for posterity so that it's clear. Or I say, how do you do that? And then they give me an answer, and then I say, but how? Um, and sometimes people forget that they don't know, they forget how much they know and how much is in their head. So what, what IDC essentially does is come in um, as an outsider and say, tell me how you're doing this process, and really help to drill down to those details that people forget they know, they forget they do it. Um, which can be so important and key to data quality. You know, if you, if you miss a step, you can end up with some funny numbers. So also what we do is serve as a recorder so that our um, state staff doesn't have to be typing and editing and, and backspacing. The IDC staff take care of that so that the state can use their energy thinking and sharing. And we highlight areas. Uh, that are needed for further discussion. Certainly with Eric and Ginger, topics came up that needed further discussion. So we parking lotted them, and then we revisited later, maybe by phone, um, to help clarify things, or if there was an area that they were unfamiliar with, uh, follow back up with. So that is what IDC does. Um, and then what you would expect in your state the participation it can change. It depends on sometimes the data collection. Um, so that if you need somebody special who happens to be dealing a lot with dispute resolution, if that is a problem in your state and you have a particularly knowledgeable person, you would want them at the table, but they may not have very much to do with the child count. So depending on the day, depending on what you're talking about, it can shift. Um, as Tony was saying, uh, we can't stress enough the importance of having the support of the Part C coordinator, spending as much time as possible in those discussions with the team, um, the data manager as well, obviously. Um, and then program staff, there's just many important people. And then we listed, you know, you can have data staff from any number of places, particularly in Part C, depending on how your program is structured. Um, there might be somebody who's outside of your agency but that you work closely with and they need to be at the table and they can shed light on issues. They can also learn from what's going on in your department and really help break down those silos. Um, this is our slide about maintenance where we talk about what happens after you do complete the toolkit. So, and actually that's what we're doing with Eric and Ginger next week is we completed this toolkit last year. We, we filled out those protocols. Um, and then you need to revisit your processes. You need to make sure that you are um, 
checking yourself and making sure that you're up to date, making sure that things are clear, if any processes change, um, updating those. Additionally, date. So if something worked particularly well and you had a very useful meeting, you might want to throw that on the calendar annually so that every year you sit down and you talk about your data governance or every year um, uh, the state direct or the state coordinator wants to sit down and review those child count numbers and talk about that. Um, it's important to assign a steward of the data processes so somebody in your department who owns them and maintains them um, knows where they are and shares them around so that if there's a new staff member that the protocols don't get lost and all of the work doesn't uh, go away. Um, and then again, as you're maintaining them, you may, if something changed, you want to write down why. Why did you start counting your kids this way? Why are you recording, um, or why are you classifying these kids as such? So that in future years, when that question comes up again, you can check your logic and you can say, this is why we did it. You know, these would be the negative consequences. You don't need to reinvent the wheel if you know why you're doing things. Um, and then again, if you have a new policy, you want to get that down and you want to know why. Um, so we see this toolkit or these protocols as an ongoing tool in your state. It's almost an added process. Maintaining these protocols is part of your yearly routine. Um, keeping your data processes consistent uh, and leading to higher quality data. That takes us to the end of the, almost the end of the chatting portion. Do we want to take some questions? I hope we have questions. Um, you can type them into the chat box. Or I think also, Rick, you can, they can raise their hands and be unmuted. Yes, at the bottom of the participants box, there is a, a hand button that you can press that will let me know that, that you would like to be unmuted. Oh, I raised my hand there. Okay, I put it back down. All right, I am not seeing any hands or questions. I will just move on to the next slide, but don't hesitate to raise your hand or throw a question in. Um, um, I think I'm closing out this webinar, Sarah. Let me know if I'm stepping on your toes. Um, so next steps, you have not heard all, all about this toolkit. I think it's amazing. What was that? I just said you're not stepping on my toes. Okay. <laughs> um, and you definitely want IDC to do this work with you. It's going to be so much fun. Um, you can reach out to your IDC state liaison. We have a map on the um, idadata.org where you can click on your state and find your liaison and um, express interest in this toolkit. Um, and they will be very excited and responsive. Um, Again, I guess we said this a couple of times, but we are currently working on data process template uh, protocols for the SPP APR indicators, and so that will be available soon. We'll be updating everybody. Also, I believe your liaisons will probably be reaching out to you or to states um, to check in, say how did, you know, you've heard about this tool now, what do you think, are you interested? Um, so let's see, uh, did any questions come in? Rick, no hands? Nope. Okay. Well then I will 
just thank everybody so much. I'd really like to thank um, Oklahoma for participating today. They were very, very helpful as we were piloting the toolkit. A uh, great group to work with, and so we're very thankful for their time. And I thank everybody for tuning in today. Have a great day.